All right, the recording has started. And I am Martha Nowak. I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of K-State Olathe to the Cases and Careers in Veterinary Medicine lecture. Today, we have Dr. Callie Rost, Assistant Dean for Admissions at uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine at uh, the Manhattan campus of K-State uh, University. We also have Hannah Johnson. She's a recruitment coordinator um, with the College of Veterinary Medicine. So uh, their topic today is called Preparing to Apply for the College of Veterinary Medicine. And I will go ahead and turn it over to um, our guest speakers. So welcome. Thank you, Martha. Uh, we appreciate that welcome. We are um, happy to be with you all today to talk a little bit about the College of Veterinary Medicine. And like Martha said, we'll cover uh, some information about applying uh, and then share with you kind of some statistics as well of who, who gets into vet school so that you can, um, if this is what your career goal is going to be, you can kind of get started building some of those experiences now and, and know what to focus on. So many of you know, uh, uh, Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine is located in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, the school began in 1905, the vet school, and our first graduating class was in 1907. Uh, so we are the sixth oldest vet school in the United States. We have been doing this for quite a while. Um, one thing that we are very proud of is the broad education that students get when they come to school here. Uh, so they work with multiple species, they learn about every major species, and they practice on every major species. So students graduate from K-State can go out and do pretty much anything they want to in the veterinary world. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the program. It is four years, uh, so the, the prerequisite courses that we'll talk about today are um, completed during your undergraduate study, and then you move into the professional program uh, for four years. So once you start college, it usually takes seven to eight years um, if you go straight through. Uh, that's not all the, always the way it goes uh, for, for students. So um, we have, we have lots of different applicants who apply to our vet school, um, and they can range from 19 years old up to 50 years old. Uh, so you just never know where life's going to take you. Um, the faculty that we have here are just fantastic, uh, in particular our first year faculty. We hear a lot of students talk about uh, the night before a big exam. Uh, the first year faculty will sometimes show up in the library the night before the exam and see if they can answer questions, help students um, who, who are struggling a little bit the night before the exam. They even did that during COVID. They had evening Zoom sessions for anybody just to log in and ask questions. So faculty are really here to help our students succeed. So we are going to talk through a couple of different processes that you can follow in order to gain admission into vet school. But the first one for you all as high school students that we're going to talk about is our early admission program. So the early admission program is specifically for exceptional candidates to K-State who are high school seniors. And how you go about applying, you first need to apply to K-State through the undergraduate admissions process. So you will follow the process as required by the Office of Recruitment and Admissions. And then after you're admitted through that process, you are eligible to apply to the early admission program. Because should you be given a seat or be offered a seat in the early admission program, we do expect that you are going to come to K-State as an undergraduate student. So in order to be considered for the early admission program, you will need a 29 composite score on your ACT. We do not use super scores. It is a composite score off of one specific ACT or an SAT equivalent, which is in the mid 1300s. So we are gonna need to see that from you. And that is the one requirement that you need to be qualified to apply. And then that third bullet point there lists 
a few of the criteria that we look at or a few of the components of the application process. So we're gonna look at your high school transcripts and what your GPA is and the courses you've taken. You're gonna write a letter of intent or sometimes that's referred to as a personal statement to tell us why you're interested in veterinary medicine and to tell us your story, a little bit about your life, how you got to where you are and why you wanna pursue this option for your future career. You'll give us some references or some letters of recommendation. And then there is an interview component associated with our early admission program as well. So you'll submit all of the application materials to us between August 1st and February 1st of your high school graduation year and your senior year. And then we will review application materials and then selected candidates will be offered an interview. And then from that interview, we will determine who we will offer a seat to in our early admission program. So how do you become a qualified applicant for early admission? What are some of the things that we need to see from you on your application? Besides that 29 ACT score, we do also wanna know about your previous experiences with animals and specifically within veterinary medicine. So, you know, if you haven't already, if you can start shadowing in a veterinary clinic, even if it's one Saturday a month or a couple days a month after school, whatever that might look like for you, getting into a veterinary clinic, observing the veterinarian, how they interact with their clients and their patients, how they, how they um, and really focusing on gaining knowledge of the profession as a whole. You'll hear me okay? Feedback is gone. Yeah, there was a little feedback, but I think we're better. Okay, great. So that is one thing that we want to see from you on your application, even as high school students. And that will be important for you, not only to start now, but if you apply through the traditional process, you'll want to get veterinary experience as well. And then you're also going to want to make sure you're involved in extracurricular activities, whether that be clubs and organizations, sports teams, music opportunities at your high school, maybe you're involved in the community, maybe you work part-time as a high school student, really, whatever you're involved in outside of the classroom, we want to see that and we want to know about it when you apply. So our early admission program in summary allows you as a high school senior, if you apply and are offered a seat uh, to have a seat in the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine or DVM program when you are ready, meaning either when you've completed your prerequisite coursework or your bachelor's degree, uh, guarantees you a seat in the DVM program. Um, and so you kind of know at the, at the outset of your collegiate career that you are coming to vet school when the time is right. We might just ask right now for questions on this. This was really the only slide on the early admissions program. So if anybody has specific questions about this program, uh, we would sure answer those for you right now. I don't have anything in chat at the moment, Okay, but but if there's anyone who wants to speak up now, it'd be great. Hello, um, I have a question. So I see that your time frame this year has already passed, correct? Yes. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's pretty hard to get into vet school. Is the early admission uh, program, is that pretty competitive as well? Um, good question, Aubrey. It, it is competitive, okay. yes. Uh, okay. We will have between anywhere from 25 to 50 applicants for um, this program each year. Okay. And uh, we do um, interview uh, a select few. We'll give everybody really kind of now we have, we're doing it with two rounds of interviews. So kind of a primary interview and then a secondary interview. Um, and we only select about 10 to, to possibly sometimes 15 students okay. for the program. Okay, thank you. Sure. 
does it start with just like an online application and then you go to the interview process after that? Yes, that is correct. Uh, the, if you just, if you go to the, the Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine website, uh, you will, and then go to apply, you'll find the early admissions application and it is an online application. And once that's completed, or really once we get to the deadline is when we gather up the, the complete applications and then begin the interview process. How many people would you say apply to the early admissions program? Usually anywhere between 25, 30, up to 50 applications. Okay. Um, if you have if you have questions further down the line, please let us know. Um, we're happy to continue to answer your questions. And just one more note on that. I did put the link to the page on the early admission program on our website in the chat. So if you all want to pull that up for further reference after the presentation is over, feel free to do so. Great. Thank you, Hannah. I wanted to cover just the, the undergraduate requirements um, that all students need to complete uh, before they start vet school. So you can be in the process of completing these requirements when you apply for vet school. We're not talking about the early admissions program anymore. This is more the traditional route for most applicants. Uh, so they will come either to K-State or to really to any um, undergraduate program. Uh, we accept credits from any accredited institution. So that can be a four-year institution, community college, or even online credits. Um, we have 64 total credit hours in the required courses. And if you look through this list, you can see there are a lot of science courses on this list. Because we are a science-based professional program, um, I would recommend working hard in those science courses uh, and being as successful academically as you can be and learning as much in those classes as you can. Uh, because really we have requirements because our courses are built uh, on those requirements. So keep that in mind as you're going through your undergraduate studies uh, and preparing to apply for vet school. Science isn't the only thing on that list. So we do have writing requirements. It's very important that a professional veterinarian be able to write correctly. Uh, public speaking is really important and not as much public speaking. We have kind of adjusted this requirement to include any communications class. Uh, because it's really about communication. It's about being able to talk to people. Um, and social sciences, humanities are also very valuable uh, to just to be a well-rounded, well-educated person. Um, those courses that you take will give you topics to talk, talk with really any um, client that you might see in the future and find something in common with them. And then electives. We want you to also be taking courses that interest you. Uh, you'll find that you're successful uh, when you take courses that are interesting to you. So again, this is outside of the early admission process. This is the application process that takes place during your, typically between your junior and senior year of undergrad. We have about 112 to 119, actually exactly 112 to 119 seats in every class. So meaning every fall between 112 and 119 students are starting vet school here at K-State every year. And for our, those seats we had, this year we had 1,475 applicants. So as you can see, uh, it's a little less than 10% of the total applicant pool that is starting vet school here at K-State. And we have listed a few criteria on this slide, parts of our application process, but also some information about GPAs that, we'll, that I'm gonna go through now. So the science GPA, that second bullet point there um, that you um, see, we put a three, four, a three, five, and a three, seven. So that's, those are average science GPAs that um, are, incoming classes have had this last year. So what that means is that's your science GPA in the prerequisite courses that are science courses that Dr. Rost showed you on that last slide. So anything from biology, 
to your chemistries, your physics, um, your genetics courses. Uh, and there is a few others that I didn't mention, but we are going to look really closely at your GPA specifically in those science courses. It's imperative that you, um, you know, work hard in those courses again to demonstrate that you are prepared for the science based professional program so that those averages are helpful for you as a future applicant just to kind of know where our students who are successful in the admission process where their GPAs sit so that you can know how to make yourself a more competitive applicant if that's taking more sciences um, to increase that science GPA. We just provide those again they're not a rule but they are averages and so it's helpful it's a helpful frame of reference to kind of know where competitive applicants sit in terms of their science GPA. We no longer require the GRE, so that is essentially the ACT, but for graduate and professional schools. So we no longer require that. We do, however, now require what's called the CASPER assessment. So it's not the ghost, if you're familiar. Um, it is, in fact, an online situational judgment uh, assessment that is going to provide you with an opportunity to think critically, think on your feet, what happens, they give you a scenario, either a video or a written scenario, and you have the chance to respond to specific questions. There are a few test scenarios on the CASPER website, and we'll show you a little bit more about the CASPER website here in just a few. But what that assessment does, it allows us to get to know your problem solving ability, your ability, like I said, to think critically. And so we utilize that as part of our application evaluation process, just to kind of see what, what your current uh, skill set around thinking on your feet really looks like. Similarly to early admission, we want you to have experience in a veterinary setting or multiple veterinary settings. And then we also want to know about any experience you have working with animals, but that might not be specifically in the veterinary setting. So that's anything uh, a little bit more advanced than pet ownership. So we don't really count pet ownership um, unless you have a pet with special needs, but it's going to be anything from maybe volunteering at an animal shelter or um, working at a doggy daycare, something like that, where you are working with animals, but not necessarily under the supervision of a veterinarian. And then those other categories, volunteer and community service, any research you've done throughout your time as an undergraduate student, any employment opportunities you've had, and then any extracurricular involvement you've had. So like I said, you're applying through the traditional application process between your junior and senior year of undergrad if you want to attend vet school right away after you graduate from undergrad. So we want to know about your experiences, not only within your undergraduate time, but also we want to look at high school experiences as well. And then in order to have a complete application, we require you, like I said, to take that CASPER assessment and then complete what's called the VIMCAS application. Um, that is an application that is pretty much every vet school in um, the United States utilizes that application with uh, the exception of a few. And then we have a supplemental application that lives on our website. So VIMCAS, the supplemental application in the CASPER assessment right now is what constitutes a complete application for us. And then once you submit all of your materials to us, the submission deadline is in September every year. We will review applications, I believe that formula is on the next slide. And then we will select candidates to interview. So not every applicant gets to interview, only some applicants will be selected to interview. And then we decide who we offer admission to based on uh, a full in-depth evaluation of the application, your GPAs, personal statements, letters of recommendation, and then your interview as well. So uh, we do have just a little information on two of the last classes that have been accepted and entered into the program. So we wanted to share those with you. Uh, right now, uh, really, 
this mirrors the national uh, application pool. Pretty much uh, our application pool is 86% women and 14% men. So um, it really has kind of veered the opposite direction of a lot of professional programs. Um, and I think when I graduated here in 1995, women barely outnumbered men. Uh, so it's really, uh, those scales have tipped quite um, a little heavier towards female, uh, but that's just because that's who, apply, who is applying for vet school. It doesn't mean that, that men can't get into vet school. So uh, we'd love that to be a little closer to 50-50 um, and see, see some men come back to, to uh, veterinary medicine. As you can see there for this class, the age range was 20 to 30. Um, we have different races and ethnicities within our classes. Um, this is a good example to show you that not everybody comes to vet school uh, right after three or four years of undergrad. Um, there are some students who maybe are getting um, a master's degree or maybe they have um, two degrees or anything. Uh, there are lots of different paths to veterinary medicine. So um, even though the, uh, the majority of our applicants will come and apply uh, when they are just finishing those prerequisites and that's reflected in that age range um, of um, 20, I think the average age of this class was 22. Um, so, all students take a lot of different uh, paths to, to our program. Uh, we do not require a bachelor's degree, so uh, we will still have about 26% of this class did not have a bachelor's degree when they began the program. We have lots of talented students from all over the country, really even all over the world uh, in our program. So we have uh, students who can speak multiple languages. Uh, these are all of the states uh, that we have students from. This was one of the classes that haven't had an average science GPA of 3.5. And we generally try to take about 50 Kansans in each class. That's gone up um, the last few years. So previously for a long time, it was 45 Kansans in our class of 112 to 119, uh, but that's now gone up to 50. There are GRE stats here, but we no longer require that GRE. Um, Hannah, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and go through this one as well. Uh, but this is the class of 2025. So they'll graduate in 2025. They are our first year students right now. Um, each year, the number of applications that we get is a little variable. Uh, we usually try to do about 430, 420 to 475 um, interviews. And then again, usually have around 50 Kansans and the rest of that class is filled with non-residents. This was a little broader age range, still about the same um, percentage of male and female students. Still, oh, sorry, still have representatives from all over the United States and all over the world. Um, we also included in this one, uh, the average experience hours. So Hannah had mentioned these areas of experience hours uh, for both um, the early admission application and then also the traditional application. Uh, so we, we do look at the veterinary experience hours, the animal experience hours, and you can see here the average of those students who were accepted into our program. These are their average, average experience hours. We do not have a minimum requirement. Uh, so I wish we would have had room for the range uh, here in this um, visual because uh, we had students who were accepted who only had six hours of veterinary experience. So very little, uh, but through other experiences and during their interview, we can see that they understood the profession uh, but maybe there were other things that were taking up their time outside of the classroom. So uh, the student was employed. They had a lot of employment hours, not as many veterinary hours. Uh, so we try to take all of that into consideration when we are reviewing applications. This was a year that was unusual. We had a pretty high average science GPA of 3.7. Um, usually we're around the 3.3 to 3.5 range for accepted students on their science GPA. So 
that's a little bit high, uh, but this has been a very successful class. They're all doing very well in the program. Um, so we're happy to have them here. We do have a couple questions in the chat that I okay. want to just get to before we keep going. So the first question, if someone were to get in through early admission, would they have to meet the undergraduate requirements as well? Great question. We do need you to complete those prerequisite courses that were on that slide where we listed them. So we are uh, going to continue to expect that you would work towards com the completion of those during your undergraduate years, just as everyone who's applying through the traditional process would. Additionally, there are a few requirements outside of academic coursework that you will need to complete or fulfill during your time at, as an undergraduate student if you are in the early admission program. That's things like attending um, a fine arts event on campus or attending um, an early admit Kind of presentation or social event that we host every uh, every year. So there are going to be different requirements that you have to fulfill. But yes, those prerequisite courses will still apply to you. And we are expecting that you will complete all of those science prerequisites here at K-State. So great question. And then the next question, would pet ownership be applicable if it's more complex than a standard cat or dog. Dr. Ross, do you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, most pet ownership does not count as animal experience. If uh, you have an animal, for instance, that has maybe diabetes, and so uh, you do have to treat that animal twice a day with insulin, uh, maybe you're monitoring urine samples, uh, that would be, you can add something like that to animal experience, but just owning a cat or owning a dog or even owning a horse or raising cattle, uh, just that alone does not. But working cattle, um, working in a, a horse um, boarding facility or over summer camps, uh, taking care of horse facilities, um, like, like Hannah mentioned earlier, animal shelter experience being exposed to animals where a veterinarian is not present. So um, the, the pet ownership, we really try to, to discourage people from entering that because we, we have had applicants enter, you know, they owned a cat their entire life and they just from age zero to where they were now. Um, and you can imagine it was a lot of hours, but um, that, that really does not count for animal experience. So it needs to really be outside your home animals. All right. So shifting back to what constitutes a complete application, I did talk about this briefly, but you'll need to complete the VIMCAS application and those subheadings there are those bullet points there um, include the components of what's required to complete the VIMCAS application. So you will need to submit a, official transcripts from any institution where you have earned college level credit. So not only your primary institution, but also any institution where you have taken credits. So if you're taking dual credits in high school, if you take a class over the summer at a community college, whatever the case might be, we'll need official transcripts from every institution. You also will enter all of your individual courses on the VIMCAS application and tell us which courses you want to use to fulfill what prerequisites. So you are going to spend some time with your transcripts and the application and putting course information. And then we want to know about all of your experiences. So I mentioned those six categories on the prior slide, animal experience, veterinary experience, volunteer and community service experience, employment experience, research experience, and then I always forget where I'm at in the sixth. Um, I think I'm, can, do you know what I'm missing, Dr. Ross? Well, I'm, I was typing. That's okay. Um, extracurricular, um, volunteer. Extracurricular. And, okay. <laughs> yes, thank you. So those are the six categories we want to know about. And we do want to know about the last eight to 10 years. So you're going to tell us about everything you've been up to. So one thing you can do to start preparing now, if you're going to apply um, through this, process or one thing you can kind of start during your undergraduate coursework is starting to keep a list 
of all of your experiences, your responsibilities, things that you participated in, so that when it comes time to fill out the application, you already have some, um, some documentation to draw from. LOR stands for letters of recommendation. We will require three, one from a veterinarian, one from a professor or an academic advisor, and then one uh, from a personal reference who's not a relative. So sometimes that's a coach, sometimes that is a practice manager at a veterinary clinic, sometimes um, that's maybe an employer or manager. So you can kind of choose your own adventure there, but it just needs to be someone who's not related to you. There are a few essay questions that are components of the VIMCAS application as well. There will be prompts and you will write responses to those. And then there is a fee to apply through VIMCAS as well. Our supplemental application, as I mentioned, lives on our website. So it is external to the VIMCAS application. You will need to fill that out as well. So it has general contact information and then you'll submit um, your VIMCAS ID number to us. So every applicant who fills out the VIMCAS application is assigned an ID number. So we'll want that ID number so we can match up your supplemental application to the VIMCAS application. You will give us your unofficial transcripts. So that's just in case there's any need for us to follow up about courses we have questions on um, from VIMCAS. So you don't have to send us official transcripts through the supplemental application. Those can be unofficial, which lots of colleges and universities um, you know, will allow you to kind of go into the student information system and download an unofficial transcript. So you can um, submit those. And then there is also a fee. And then we talked about the CASPER assessment, but we do require you to take the CASPER assessment. And similarly to an ACT or an SAT, you'll have the opportunity to send your scores to um, the schools that need it. And so you would just select the College of Veterinary Medicine at K-State to send your scores to. Great. I'll say on this slide too, to just always keep an eye on the website. Um, the requirements for application can change. Uh, so just keep an eye on that as you get closer to application. We also try um, to, of course, keep our website up to date, but we also do a lot of visits with pre-vet clubs and with um, classes here on um, our campus uh, just to educate people about the requirements and how to apply and how to be the most competitive. Uh, I wanted to just go over what is CASPER looking for? What, um, what really is involved in that assessment? So I, Hannah has explained it well that you will have either a video or a printed scenario, uh, and then you'll have three questions that you need to respond to um, based on that scenario. And these are the qualities that that CASPER assessment is looking for. So medical schools have used CASPER for multiple years uh, veterinary programs are just kind of getting to the point where we are considering it in our admissions process. But you can see uh, by these criteria that there are things that, that every professional school is going to be looking for uh, in their applicants and in students who are accepted into their program. So just wanted to give you an idea of what CASPER is looking for in those responses. I'll go for it. So this is the slide that I thought was next earlier. So sorry, it was several slides later, everyone. But this is how we evaluate applications. So this is detailed in more depth on our website, but we do two evaluations of applications. The first, or our primary evaluation, we are going to do a thorough review of your academics. Specifically, we look at three different GPA calculations. One of those is going to be your GPA and our science prerequisites. The second is going to be your GPA and all of our prerequisites. And then the third is going to be your GPA and your most recently completed 45 credit hours. So that's typically about the last three semesters. So we look at those three. GPA calculations and that uh, they are weighted at about 60% of the application review and then we're going to look at your experiences as well. So we've mentioned experience many times. 
but that is really where that comes into play in the application evaluation. So that 71% makes up the first initial primary evaluation and also helps us determine who we will invite to interview. So we invite around 400 to 450 applicants every year to interview with us out of that pool of this, this year, it was a, a pool of almost 1500, 1475. So we interviewed about 420 students this year. And those who are invited to interview, they go through that secondary review. So that second um, bullet point there, that application review, your application gets assigned to a review committee, which they review your application in detail. So your letters of recommendation, your essay questions, they also will look at your academics and your experiences. And then they will also be the folks who will interview you as well. And then we're also going to look at your CASPER score in that secondary evaluation process. And those secondary components make up 29% of the overall um, application evaluation. So when it comes time for us to determine who we offer admission to, it's all of those components together going into um, who we offer admission to. If you are not selected to interview, uh, an interview is required. You do have to interview with us as um, part of the admission process. So if you are not selected to interview, um, you might want to think about applying again in future years. Um, so if you don't make it to that interview stage, um, just know that our interview is required. All right, very good. Okay, so now on to just a little bit more about the veterinary program. Uh, we wanted to share just a few things about the program once students do get here. Um, we do have a clinical skills course each semester. So the first week of the first year, students will be practicing clinical skills. Um, this is new within the last four or five years. Uh, and it's made a huge difference for our students when, when they get to third year and get into anesthesia and surgery. Uh, they're not trying to learn how to draw blood and put in, put in an IV catheter as well as doing surgery. Uh, they already have those base, basic skills so they can just focus on developing their surgery skills. Same thing once they get into um, the hospital, the veterinary um, health center, they have um, a good, uh, good knowledge of the clinical skills and they've had plenty of time to practice that they can focus on practicing being a veterinarian and implementing uh, those clinical skills instead of again learning a new clinical skill while they are already in the hospital. So it's been a very good program for our students. Um, they graduate being uh, very practice ready, meaning they can walk into a hospital and they don't need somebody to teach them uh, how to do really any any clinical skill. Uh, they've been exposed to all of them in vet school and um, each semester we just build on those skills uh, so they can continue to practice what they learned in first year, but we build on those skills then in second and third year before they get into the hospital. I am hopping, popping a link into the chat to answer um, the question about the admissions timeline, how long will it take after turning in your application to know if you're getting interviewed or not? This link is helpful just to see the whole process at a glance, but your application's due in September, and then we typically issue inter interview invitations in November. So it takes a couple months to know if you've been selected to interview. Good. And, and applicants do have plenty of time as well. So the, the national VIMCAS application that we mentioned opens in January and it will be due sep in, the, in September. Uh, the school portions of the VIMCAS and then any supplemental applications open in May. And then you have until September to uh, complete those applications as well. So a little bit more information for you all on our Veterinary Health Center. We call it the VHC for short. It is our full service veterinary teaching hospital here on campus. So we do both 
uh, small and large animal, or I guess small animal, large animal, exotics, equine, et cetera. So full service hospital here on campus that does provide essential training for our fourth year students. Our fourth year students do get to serve on rotations for an entire 12 months during their fourth year of vet school. And they are serving on rotations in anything from routine care to specialty services. You can see some examples of those specialty services listed on that last bullet point there. And then we do also provide emergency care in the VHC as well. So routine, meaning anything from physical exams, um, vaccinations, um, specialty, like I said, cardiology, oncology, et cetera, any specialty you can think of that might exist in human medicine, we have the ability to care for our, uh, our animal patients in that way as well. Um, and then we provide emergency care and intensive care for both small and large animal patients as well. So there's a lot going on over there. Our, our students, like I said, they're serving on rotations that sometimes last anywhere from, I think two to three to four weeks at a time. Um, so they're getting training that's essential to them for when you know they take a job offer and they get out into practice after they leave us after that fourth year. So lots of hands-on opportunities throughout the curriculum, but especially within that fourth year. And as a fourth year student, you'll be working with a lot of highly qualified and technically skilled staff in the VHC. So we do have board certified surgeons those who have not only completed vet school, but have gone on to complete internships and residencies and take their board exams to be certified in their specialty area. Um, veterinarians who are on our faculty, um, who you know have been many of them doing the work in their field for a number, a high number of years, and then an incredible team of veterinary technicians and nurses who really are Kind of the backbone of the operation. So you get the chance to learn from and with all of those people in your time as a veterinary student. One other special program that we have is the mobile surgery unit. Uh, this is uh, the vehicle here has two uh, surgery units within it. Uh, they travel to humane societies and animal shelters within about a two hour uh, radius of Manhattan, spay and neuter dogs and cats. Um, and this is, it, it out, we should just not even put a number on here because it outdates very quickly, but we're now over 30,000 procedures that we have done out of this mobile surgery unit. Um, fourth year students spend a two week rotation and each of them will do about 50 um, surgical procedures. So by the time they finish this rotation, they'll really be able to handle any abdominal surgery that they might have when they get out into practice. The great thing about it is there's really no cost to Kansas State. There is no cost to the animal shelter or humane society. Um, it is a donation. The vehicle and the, the trailer itself uh, was a donation from a donor. And then PetSmart uh, supports it each year as well. So um, it's an incredible program unique to Kansas State uh, great opportunity for our students. So we've talked a lot about how to get here, what the experience is like from a student perspective and, and from the academic side. And this slide helps us just to mention a few things that exist for students outside the classroom. So the student support that exists here within the college is really incredible and continues to grow all the time. We do have two full-time licensed professional counselors on staff specifically for use by our students. So we wanna make sure that you all are connected with the wellness resources you need to succeed as veterinary students. And you have the opportunity uh, to take advantage of free and unlimited visits with those two counselors, meaning you can schedule 
a, a regular therapy appointment. You can do a once a semester check-in. You might want to check in one time during the fall semester of your freshman year. No matter what the needs might be, and maybe you just want to wave hello to them in the hallway. That All of that is fine, um, but they are here really for um, creating a network of support in whatever way is needed um, for you as veterinary students. So not only do they primarily provide counseling um, and therapy services for our students, but they also oversee things like weekly yoga sessions and other wellness programming. And we have what's called the Purple Pantry here within the college. And what that is, that is a food pantry, which is an extension of what's called Cat's Cupboard on our main campus. But essentially any member of the college community, student, faculty, staff who may need a little extra support um, or may need some um, food maybe over the weekend or um, you know, at any point, we have non-perishable food items available for um, those members of our community who, like I said, maybe um, could use a little extra support in that area. And then if you're interested in involvement outside of the classroom, we do have over, this is 25, this is another number that often gets ahead of us. I believe we're now up to over 40 student clubs and organizations. Great opportunity for learning for students. Great opportunity to find people who are like-minded, either in their area of interest or maybe they share a similar identity or life experience to you. Uh, so we have things like canine club, bovine club, we have a new Latinx veterinary medical association, um, an organization called voice, which is a veterinarians for one inclusive community, I believe for excellence or equity. Empowerment. Empowerment. Okay. Three E words, everybody. Dr. Ross got me there on the last one. Um, so anyway, there are just many different opportunities um, for you to be involved outside of the classroom and to learn more about veterinary medicine through club involvement as well. Great. So what should you be doing right now? Um, certainly, if you're in high school, taking as much college level math and science as possible uh, will help prepare you for those undergraduate requirements that you're going to need to take to apply for vet school. Um, focus on that uh, any communication that you can. So written communication, verbal communication, it's all very important. Uh, you're going to have to be able to speak with people um, as a veterinarian. So those are important skills to, to really work on and perfect uh, as you finish through high school and college. Spend some time with a veterinarian uh, if you can. Right now, it's been a little difficult with um, COVID. Uh, some practices have not been letting students come into their hospitals. So hopefully as things slow down a little bit, um, vet clinics will open back up and, and let some students back into those hospitals. Um, if you can get a variety of veterinary experience, that's helpful as well. Really the purpose of that, that experience is really just to understand the profession, um, have a good view of what is a daily, um, the, the life uh, of a veterinarian on a daily basis, uh, and is it something that you think you could do every single day? So it helps to answer that question. Uh, it helps to spend time with a veterinarian and, and really get a feel for what the profession is really all about. Um, also, those experiences uh, should also help you build relationships uh, that will lead to a, a great letter of reference. So any experience that you have, you should make sure that it's a two-way street. So you want to learn about the profession, but you also want those people that you're spending time with to learn about you. So make sure you stay engaged, make sure you're asking questions, um, learning as much as you can when you are spending that valuable time uh, with those veterinarians. And then um, be working on those extracurricular activities as well. So volunteer, um, at your school, outside of your school, uh, be involved, um, take some leadership opportunities if you uh, can find them. Uh, that'll be another valuable thing uh, that you can put on your application and that you'll build skills that you can then use uh, once you do become a veterinarian. 
So um, we are here to answer any other questions that you might have. Uh, this is our email address here. If you do have questions, you can email us. This is our phone number. Um, we might put the um, schedule a visit, Hannah's on it, uh, schedule a visit link in the chat. Uh, we, we, do, we are doing visits. Uh, you can do virtual visits or in-person visits. So um, we'd welcome you to come and learn a little bit more about our college uh, and the opportunities here. So I'd say at this time, we'll take any other questions that might be out there. Had one that was in the chat, Dr. Ross or uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, this one said, would it be wise to apply to multiple schools, veterinary schools, or just K-State if I am from Kansas? Does that give me a better uh, feel for admission or do I go ahead and apply all over the nation? Mm -hmm. A great question. I think I would give a couple of considerations in making the determination to or, or how to answer that. So, you know, we've talked about how the process can be competitive. We've shown you some stats on what that process looks like from a number standpoint. So, you know, as you are thinking about your future and financing your education in particular, certainly tuition will be. Um, lower for a, a resident of Kansas should you attend K-State. Um, so if finance is a consideration, um, which it is for many applicants, many students, um, I would say certainly kind of take that into consideration as you are thinking about applying. That being said, you will certainly, um, you know, want to consider different options as you think about your veterinary education. So every school is gonna approach their curriculum a little bit differently. Um, you know, what they offer their students might look different. So um, that is a good thing to look into. And then of course, from an odds perspective or a chances perspective, you know, the more places you apply, um, certainly there will be, um, you know, potentially a greater chance of admission so I would say, you know, if you are a Kansas resident and you, um, you know, know that K-State is the right option for you, you can certainly stick with us and, um, and then, and then see, see how the process shakes out. But um, I think we would, we would also probably encourage um, you to take a look at options um, that are not us as well. So I had a question oh, um, and it was about financial aid. So do you guys offer any financial aid for during your education as well as for graduates after? For graduates after when they become veterinarians? Yes. Is that what you mean? Okay. Uh, well, we do have scholarships for students uh, in the DVM program. And how that works, at least for our college, is that students who are accepted into the program will come to orientation uh, the week before classes start, and that is when they fill out the scholarship applications. Uh, so they find out usually about mid-fall semester uh, if they receive one of those internal scholarships. Uh, there is financial aid for graduate students, professional students, uh, and of course it's at a higher level because uh, those courses are more expensive than undergraduate courses. So um, students just have to be sure that they have completed 72 credit hours of their undergraduate program to be considered a professional student uh, and qualify for that professional level financial aid. So. Yes, there, there is aid available. We also have, uh, if you just search uh, vet student scholarships, you will find pages and pages of scholarships available to apply for. Uh, and we encourage all students to do that. Our students too, they don't just do that like before they start vet school, they are doing that continually, looking for scholarships to apply for. Uh, we also get information from companies that that will send out to our students uh, any opportunity that arises for for scholarship applications. So 
Um, there are opportunities to fund your education. Uh, it is an investment to become a veterinarian. Uh, we don't necessarily have um, scholarship or aid for after you graduate. However, uh, there are a few um, opportunities such as the veterinary training program for rural Kansas, the VTPRK. Uh, we have five of those um, scholarships each year that we award to students, not necessarily from Kansas, uh, but students who uh, intend to stay in Kansas to practice for at least four years in a rural community. Uh, and that is a really good scholarship. It's about $20,000 a year. Uh, and then, uh, you know, those students really have, if they're non-resident students, uh, they, they have half of the tuition paid for. Uh, but if they don't fulfill those four years in their rural practice setting, then they do have to pay back that scholarship. So we do want to make sure that the students who receive those scholarships are um, going to stay in rural Kansas uh, and practice. Uh, many states have programs like that. For, so for students who aren't from Kansas and want to go back to their home state, uh, they can look for, for those types of scholarships as well. And then there is also the um, kind of health professions uh, service loan forgiveness. So if you do end up working in, say, an animal shelter or something like that, that's more of a service oriented job, um, then uh, a lot of times the loans are just forgiven. I think it I think you have to work in that environment for 10 years uh, before your loan is forgiven. And then there is also a military scholarship. So uh, students who are interested in serving in the military following graduation uh, can receive tuition and a stipend while they're in vet school. And then they owe, I don't know, is it four years, Hannah? Um, four years following graduation there as yes, well. It is four. Yep. So lots of, lots of options out there. Thank you very much for your response. I really appreciate it. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, what would you say is the best way to reach out to different practices regarding shadowing and gaining experience? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, I would just say that, you know, if, if you're just looking for shadowing, uh, sending even just a resume, so, so vet veterinarians and clinics cl and, and practice managers can see um, what you've done in the past uh, and have your contact information and then follow up sending a resume with a phone call or an email as well. You know, any way that you can contact uh, a, a large amount of practices and find one that will allow you to come in and shadow. And even if it's just like Saturday mornings, uh, you know, that's a start. And if you are that type of um, shadow <laughs> who asks questions and you're involved and you're interested, you will find most veterinarians want to help you. They want to teach you about their, their profession and it could certainly lead into more experience time or sometimes even a job. Um, if you if you are very involved during your shadow experience. But starting with a resume and phone calls, and if you have a kind of a personal family veterinarian that you use, um, also make sure that you that you talk to them and let them know that you're interested. And most veterinarians, as soon as we know someone else is interested, we want to tell you all about it. So um, usually uh, that's a good place to start as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, how early can you start counting your hours leading up to like your application process? Sure. Um, Hannah, do you wanna answer that one? <laughs> Either way, um, you will want to start counting your hours now as a high school student. So we will look at your experiences from the last eight to 10 years if you apply through the traditional application process. Um, for early admission, we would want to know, you know, kind of what you've been up to in high school the last several years. Um, but so you can start now. Um, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you want to go ahead and kind of start keeping a running list or a, um, a little bit of a, a digest, if you will, of your experiences, so that when it comes time to apply, you have that to draw from, but you can start now. Thank you. 
So I work at a veterinary clinic and I was wondering if I should still be volunteering at a animal shelter or if I should just keep working there. That's a great question. Um, you know, you are getting veterinary experience already by if you're working at that clinic. And so that is experience that you can use on your application and should use. Um, and so, you know, if there are other um, opportunities like volunteering at an animal shelter or even volunteering at something that's not animal related, you can certainly do that if that fits into your schedule. That will also be helpful supplemental experiences to put on your application. Um, but, you know, if you have a good relationship with the veterinary clinic that you are already working at, um, you know, you can certainly count that as veterinary experience. We will never say, you know, the more experience that you can get, great, but um, I would say, you know, can, you can continue to maintain what you're doing already. And I'll add just a touch to that is that one experience you can only use in one category. So your veterinary experience can only go under veterinary experience. You wouldn't be able to use that as both veterinary and animal experience. So, um, and if it's employment, you still just want to put it under veterinary experience, even though there's an employment category. So um, there, there is a really good guide for applicants. Once you guys get to that point that, that you want to apply, um, it's on the AAVMC, so the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges, uh, have a lot of resources, and they're really the, the, the organization that um, puts out VimCast, that application. So it is a website that has a lot of good resources for students, and it very specifically describes how to fill out this experience section. So that'll be a good resource for you as well. Thanks, Ann. And Hannah's put that link in chat for everybody to refer to. So that's a great resource. Okay, well, any other questions out there? What would you say are good techniques for managing stress? Because I know it's a really stressful field. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it kind of depends on the individual, I would say, you know, um, you, you need to kind of learn your, your skill set uh, in handling stress. Um, you know, some people exercise uh, to get rid of stress. Sometimes some people just relax and read or, uh, you know, just to take their mind off of things. Um, I would say developing good study skills and good time management skills uh, will help prevent stress uh, when you're in a professional program. So keep yourself organized, keep yourself on track, and that prevents that panic before an exam, um, you know, of, of not feeling prepared and, and that just causes stress. So, um, and like Hannah explained, our counselors are very helpful in, in helping students with all of those things because a lot of students who, maybe don't have to study very much in high school and even don't have to study very much in undergraduate, they get to vet school and they realize that this is a totally different ball game. So, um, you know, if, if school's been easy for you up until then, vet school's usually a new challenge. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I had another question. Um, would you recommend taking any business classes in case you're trying to go to a higher profession in this field of study? Sure, um, I think that business classes are very helpful uh, because you know most veterinarians don't have that um, business savvy without some education. Uh, you know, we really wanna just focus on taking care of the animals and taking care of our clients. Uh, and so the business aspect um, just kind of falls to the wayside sometimes, so absolutely. Uh, getting some education in uh, business and business management uh, could be very, very valuable. Um, one other thing I should say is that you can have a major in pretty much anything that you're interested in. So you do not have to be an animal science major or a biology major to get into vet school. Uh, we have had students who are business majors. We've had engineering majors. 
um, just as long as they finish our prerequisites before they come to vet school, um, you can have a you can have a major in anything that you would like. Uh, so I recommend choosing a major that is very interesting to you, uh, because when you're interested in something, you'll be much more successful uh, in in your classes. So. You can be even be a business major. Just make sure you take all those science courses and um, then you can apply for vet school. It's a good combination. So quick question. Um, I've worked at the same vet clinic for the like the past two years. And about the last six months, he's just had me do do a lot of cleaning. Um, and like, I know that's a part of the job, but would you say um, it's about time to move on to a different clinic to get more experience there? Or should I keep working at the clinic I am now to see if it goes back to me shadowing more? Um, are you, is this just a small animal clinic or is it a mixed animal practice? It's, it's mixed animal. Okay. So you're getting a wide variety of species exposure. Yes. I yes. guess I would, I, I would. I would say two things. One, you, you probably should just have a conversation um, with, yes. with your boss and say, you know, what happened? Mm -hmm. uh, and could I possibly get back into a little more shadowing yes. working with you? Um, speaking of, I did talk to him about it over the summer and he just said, that's where I need you right now. Um, should I go ahead and talk to him again and see that's what I would recommend. Okay. I mean, communication usually yeah. um, helps you okay. helps you get where you want to be. So, um, yeah, I would probably just bring it up again, and and maybe you just need to specifically say, um, you know, I I really would like to work more with you. So, can we look for maybe a balance between okay. where you need me and where I would like to be? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Ross and uh, Ms. Johnson for tuning in and giving us some incredible uh, information and links, resources that you guys can use. I believe they put their um, email. If you have further questions, I'm sure they would like to um, know if they've satisfied your curiosity totally or if there is, it's just led you a little bit deeper into questions. So, Thank you so very much. But in the interest of time, we are eight minutes over and I want to be respectful of, of your time, everybody's time. So thank you so very much for coming and um, not just our guest speakers, but all of the participants. We enjoyed yeah. having you. So feel free to contact us. Um, I will also put mine uh, here in the chat and you can contact me and uh, I can be helpful, I think. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and end the meeting. All righty. Thanks, thank you all. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.